Okay, so so you're ready to do the the you're ready to do the podcast? The cock past. <laughs> the cock past. <laughs> <laughs> What's wrong with you? What's no, wrong with that's you? That's what you were gonna say. No. Yes. You're crazy. No. You're crazy. No. You're crazy. No. I might have to include this into the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> then go ahead. Let the world if that's, you know what? That's the start. This is the start <laughs> of C squared number 17. <laughs> Yeah, it's been a while. Uh, a lot of stuff's been happening the last two months, and it's been definitely quiet on my end, but I have been busy. I have been doing a lot of things, good lord. Mortal Kombating. And while I've been doing that, I've also been playing all of the RPG mega houses that have come out for the last yes. three months. Yes. Because they dropped three major RPGs. They dropped friggin' Yakuza uh, Infinite Wealth, they dropped Persona 3 Reload, and they dropped, of course, Final Fantasy VII Rebirth, two of which we're going to get to at the end of this podcast, but uh, I still not, I still didn't have time to play Persona 3 Reload because there's just too much shit. There's just too many RPGs, and my god. No, I am, like, entirely the same boat as you are. I have all three games. Um, I went... Okay, so... Just to sum it up super quickly... I got Infinite Wealth when it came out, and then I stopped playing Infinite Wealth to play Final Fantasy VII Rebirth. Now that I've beaten Rebirth, now I'm back to Infinite Wealth, and once I've beaten Infinite Wealth, I'm going to jump into Persona 3 Reload. <laughs> and I'm, like, absolutely fine with not playing any other video games for the rest of the year, because I'm pretty happy. Um, Infinite Wealth and Rebirth have, as Infinite Wealth and Rebirth are my two most anticipated games of 2024, so I'm, like, done. <laughs> <laughs> I'm good. If I don't have to play any more video games for the rest of the year, I'd be so happy with that. So that's where I am, too. Nice, nice, nice. So, yeah, we were going to talk about some of those RPGs going later. But a month ago, we went on a trip together to see something very, very special. Yes. We saw the building that was in American Psycho. Hell yeah. <laughs> you know, the lobby... The lobby where yes. Christian Bale goes into, and he's like, wait a minute, this is in my apartment. <laughs> Burning the midnight oil, eh, Slick? And so he pulls out a gun and he shoots him in the face. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. I think, I think I know what you're talking about. Yeah. You're talking about City Hall, which was in the Resident Evil movie. Oh, from, yeah. Like, the oh, that's so distracting. That that's so distracting. <laughs> Because it's like you're watching Resident Evil Apocalypse, the second live action version with Nemesis and uh, GTA, motherfucker, that guy. <laughs> and um, that final climax, the final battle between Alice and Nemesis takes place right in front of City Hall in Toronto. And it's like the most iconic building. It's like the most recognizable building in Toronto. Other than the CN Tower, of course. I was and gonna it's say. like, <laughs> as a Canadian, you just can't help but be distracted that Nemesis and Alice are fighting in the middle of Toronto. Like, I keep expecting to see the Toronto sign right behind them. <laughs> she runs down City Hall. She runs down the building sideways. <laughs> it's great. You showed me the clip. I haven't seen the movie, but I have seen that clip because of you. <laughs> okay, 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 okay. Okay, okay. I'm going to stop fucking around here all right we might or might not have gone to a symphony starring a particular blue hedgehog and we may not have listened to this orchestral ensemble which turned into a hell of a rock concert later on but yes um we went and saw the sonic symphony in toronto and let me tell you it was a hell of a wait for me because um, all the United States dates happened first, and Canada was actually one of, like, the later dates in that North American, like, leg of this world tour. Yeah. So it was so agonizing seeing, like, my friends go to, like, the symphony tour dates, 
all across the states. I had a couple of friends that go, went to the Chicago one. I knew a couple of friends that went to Seattle and Atlanta and LA. And I'm like, <laughs> I'm so happy for y'all, but I'm still waiting. <laughs> <laughs> all just so you could go with little old me. Yeah. And technically the closest ones to me were like, I had the chance to fly in October um, to Chicago, but I couldn't because of like work reasons. And technically the closest date to me was New York in June, but I'm like, uh, I'll wait. But yes, I did want to wait to see the symphony with you and our friend Stefan and no regrets. Absolutely amazing time. I cried a lot. <laughs> the first thing I want to point out before we go though, is that we had the absolute drip. Okay. <laughs> we knew the assignment. Yes, we did. We knew the assignment, and we came prepared, and we dressed for the occasion, and uh, I went with a, a Eggman-themed color style for my dress shirt and tie, and of course, you looked stunning as classic Amy Rose. Damn straight I did. I've had this outfit idea in my head for a very long while, so I was like, yes, I have the top, I just need to get the skirt, and it just came together amazingly. It was awesome. It was great. I, I loved how many people recognized you. Yes. <laughs> I think I recognized like another classic game. I'm like, wait, I know what you're doing. And it's like the <laughs> yeah. only place where I could get away with something like this. <laughs> Amy Solidarity. <laughs> yes, Amy Solidarity. The best version of Amy. I am definitely more of a classic Amy type than modern Amy. I love modern Amy. She's great. But classic Amy was the Amy that I grew up with. So... Not everyone wants the go-go boots or the big red skirt. <laughs> <laughs> There's so many panty shots in Sonic Adventure. I mean, my God. Oh, gosh. <laughs> it's true, though. It's true. We need to talk about this when they remake Sonic Adventure. We need to discuss how they can't do it again. <laughs> no, sir. Red alert. <laughs> But, uh, yeah, we went to Meridian Hall, and um, surprisingly, I got recognized, like, maybe two minutes in. About five minutes in. We were going to the bar. Yeah. I wanted a drink. <laughs> no, just, we went in, and then we went to the bar mm -hmm. immediately, because we're alcoholics. And uh, <laughs> You didn't drink, though. <laughs> no, I didn't drink at all. <laughs> no. Just you and Stefan. You and Stefan were trashed off your ass, that's all. No, we weren't. <laughs> they were so drunk. Good lord. Falling over <laughs> each other. Come on. Stefan's the lighter one. <laughs> Stefan had booze in his in his top hat. No, but we definitely uh, got recognized a few times, which was fun. It was very sweet. I mentioned it like when we did our MacFest um, podcast, but it's just always very sweet when things like that happen. Like, I wasn't expecting it considering, like, I was in a different part of like the world outside of like the US. But um to those of you that came up to me, came up to Clint, thank you so much. I'm very enlightened and heartened that like you love C squared. I don't know. It just make it, it makes me feel fuzzy. I get the little fuzzies. Yeah. <laughs> I, I like that moment where I was like, oh I love the C I love the podcast. I love C squared. I'm like, oh yeah, yeah. And I kind of gesture to you. And you're like, wait a minute, this is Caro? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's very strange to hear that I got some people into Sonic, which is weird to think about. Because I don't even know how people discover me if they're not, like, Sonic fans. It's like... <laughs> <laughs> I guess they just were interested in Sonic and was on YouTube in the early 2010s. Why me, of course. I mean, okay, whatever. I, I guess so. But yeah, what'd you think of the set? What'd you think of the the songs chosen and all that stuff? Well, how many times did I look over at you <laughs> during the symphony? <laughs> a few, a bit. With tears. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it was the, the most magical part for me was definitely the classic lineup. Because like nothing against the Sonic Frontiers songs or any of the vocal tracks or anything. But it's it's so different to hear songs that are usually in 16-bit processed kind of chiptune thing 
Mm -hmm. but like done with an orchestra that just feels so much more magical it feels so much more special and again sonic the hedgehog 2 is my absolute favorite video game of all time it's the best friggin' game i've ever played in my opinion and uh they did an entire medley just dedicated to that one game it wasn't like they just did a medley for the classic era no no it was there was a sonic 1 medley there was a sonic 2 medley and the sonic 2 medley was just like oh my god yeah that's the shit like that's that's what got me into gaming that's what's kept me Mm -hmm. into gaming that's like the game that means the most to me and to be able to go dressed up with a whole bunch of like-minded people to see my favorite game's music performed that way that was a magical moment for me it really was and um i played a lot of clarinet when i was um a kid or a teenager and I play. I played in a lot of like band ensembles and orchestras. And like, one of the songs I would always warm up with on the clarinet, like before I would start playing a piece or whatever, um, was a classic Sonic song of my choice. So sometimes I played Green Hill Zone, or sometimes I played Spring Yard, or sometimes I played Emerald Hill on the clarinet, just to kind of just warm up my lungs and my fingers to like play. Yeah. Um. So like, I've always associated sonic music to hypothetically sound amazing if played in like an orchestra and to just really get that was so emotional to see which is why i was crying a lot in the first half of the show because it's something i've wanted to see for years and yeah i'm with you in that like how many times do you get to like go to a place with a lot of like-minded people with a lot of sonic fans like i never thought this would be a reality like 10 years ago we would all like dress up and go to like an orchestra concert with sonic music like that yeah. would bl- that would have blown my mind as a kid and i just feel really grateful to have an opportunity like this now it just really makes you think you know like how much yeah. better like how much better of a place sonic is in now it's not perfect but like people still love sonic love is very much still there oh yeah still extremely popular it, it also just makes you appreciate the compositions a lot more because it's like Sonic 1 is obviously a classic. It's the reason this franchise even exists. Like, Sonic 1, it was the best platformer at the time on the Sega Genesis when it came out. Mm -hmm. And when you hear those compositions, it really makes you appreciate just how good that music is. Because, like, Starlight comes up, and you're just like, ah. Oh, gosh. That was one of the pieces that made me just start bawling. I was like, ah! Even like Scrap Brain, you know, they start doing yes. that theme and on, but with violins and stuff, and it's just like, oh my god, dude! I just flashed back to me, fourteen years old, sitting in the band room, um, playing my clarinet and playing that do 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 do. It's emotional. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely, and it also it made me think when I was leaving that theater, uh, when we when it was all said and done, like. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know what? The Sonic movies are dropping the ball a little bit because these are amazing compositions, and to have that be the background music for like a lot of the stuff that Sonic's doing in those movies would benefit so much. It would enhance the movie so much to be like Mario, and to actually have like more Green Hill, Chemical Plant, Starlight, you know, just more of that stuff in the background as things are happening. Right. The really cool part about this concert, actually, was, like, the first half was very, like, orchestra-oriented, so, like, definitely very reliant on the ensemble that was there. But the second half of the concert, after intermission, was very rock-focused. So that's where you got all the vocal Sonic tracks, and that was just really cool to see performed with a mix of rock music and the orchestra backing that up. So that was really, really fun. Everybody was singing along. This wasn't one of those concerts where everyone just stays polite and doesn't make a noise. Like, no, no, no. We, everyone was just singing along to the music and jumping up and yeah. down and standing up. Admittedly, that was one of the things I was worried about because since I've been in orchestras, I'm a stickler for orchestra etiquette. But if the venue and if the performers say it's fine to sing and clap and stuff, I'll defer to you. So it was just a really fun time to sing and, like, scream to those lyrics. Oh, gosh. The family that was sitting next to us. The mom and her kids. Yeah. 
You remember them? Oh, yeah. Like, at the beginning of the concert, obviously, like, the mom's there for, like, her kids because the kids love Sonic. You know, she's just there to bring them in and support them. But then by the end of the concert, she was really getting into the music. (laughs) She was, like, recording (laughs) on her phone. I think that's just really sweet. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, there's going to be a lot of people who bring their kids because, well, they're Sonic fans. They want to see the Sonic concert. I mean, whatever. It's to humor them. I don't play the games. Whatever. But then... When they get there, they're going to be like, wait a minute, this is Sonic music? What? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what do you mean? Why Why do Sonic video games have all of these crazy rock tracks and heavy metal music and all this other stuff? Like, what the hell is happening here? <laughs> <laughs> I just remember when they started playing, like, uh, Metal Sonic's uh, boss theme from Sonic Heroes, what I'm made of. Just looking over at everyone rocking out and everyone singing along and just be like, what? the great thing is they have this really clean really clean like uh video going on and on the projector just huge very crystal clear imagery that's going along with the music in time with the music so like you know you're not just listening to all of this nostalgia you're watching all of this nostalgia when they're playing what I made of from Sonic Heroes, you're seeing them actually battle in the in the game itself. You're actually seeing the boss fight and you're seeing the CG render cutscenes where Metal Sonic transforms into the mega monstrosity at the end. And <laughs> it was a big trip down memory lane because you, you start remembering yeah. like they did a fun gag with the drowning music and classic Sonic's bit. So like Oh yeah. <laughs> The video would like zoom in on Sonic and Sonic looks like he's panicking and like and the crowd like starts freaking out like, oh my god, oh no. <laughs> <laughs> and it was just it just reminds you of all the places this franchise has been and from the Dreamcast to the GameCube to the HD times and the Wii and all that stuff. And yeah, it was just a big trip down memory lane. It just reminded you of everything that Sonic has been for these past 30 years. It was, of course you get emotional. Of course you get emotional watching that because it's just like, oh my God, this is such a legacy now. It really is. And I think it's cross generations because like, it was so interesting seeing the reactions to different Sonic games, but I think unanimously every single one of us freaked out for Sonic Frontiers when the music was being played. Like the kids, the adults, the teenagers, like unanimously, that was just like, one of the most hype parts of that concert. Yeah. So Frontiers getting like some of the louder reactions of the night was very rightly deserved. Oh, for sure. I mean, when we went to the concert hall, it's like we didn't just see like nothing but neckbeard adults, you know? No. no. <laughs> we, we saw lots of teens. We saw lots of uh, children. We saw lots of like younger audiences coming to see this thing. And it's like, I know I'm 35 years old. I played Sonic 2 when it was new. Like, I was there with the Genesis era. I remember (laughs) playing these games when I was five or six years old, and it's like, you know, I I don't expect every kid to have the same exact experience I did. I imagine their first Sonic games are probably, like, Generations or Frontiers, just Frontiers, period, you know? Yeah. And no, like, I'm 27, and my, like... The current generation of games when I was, like, three or four when I started playing was, like, the PlayStation 1 and the N64, like, that era. But um, I was playing a Genesis around that time, so I have that childhood, very early childhood experience with the classic Sonic games, even though it was after, you know, the peak of it. Yeah. But also for me and for a lot of 2000 Sonic fans, our stuff was the adventure games, Heroes, 06. Secret Rings, Black Knight, a lot of kids in my generation really gravitate to those games. And it was just really fascinating to see, like, what Sonic fans really vibed for what games. You know? Yeah. Just hearing them cheer when, like, Shadow the Hedgehog is going to (laughs) play. Yeah. (laughs) They're going to listen to I Am All of Me. Holy shit. (laughs) Like, Shadow's my generation. When I was nine years old and got Shadow the Hedgehog for the GameCube, and he, like... Held the gun up and glocked it at the beginning <laughs> of the game. I was like, whoa, what's this? Oh my god. <laughs> He's gonna kill like these that humans. Whole intro, that whole intro of Shadow the Hedgehog, as bad of a, of a game it is, that <laughs> intro of Shadow was just 
wow, generational, <laughs> formative for me at my age. Because I'm like, what the fuck is this? I'm going to cheer for this from now on. <laughs> I love when Mark he cocks the assault rifle. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there's one thing that's universal is that Shadow the Hedgehog will always be popular. He will always yes. be mega and... over popular. <laughs> and I bet you, and this is an early like projection, but it wouldn't surprise me if this happened. I bet you that the box office numbers for Sonic 3 will be higher than the other two just because of Shadow. Oh, yeah. Oh, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. It's like some people are saying like Sonic Prime wasn't that great. But you know what was great about Sonic Prime? Shadow. Shadow. <laughs> <laughs> he was great in it. <laughs> yep. Yeah, it was a very, very, very fun time. I mean, I didn't sing a lawn because I feel like that would have destroyed my throat. And I was definitely more enamored, not to say that I didn't, I didn't like the second half, but I was definitely more enamored with the pure orchestra stuff. I wasn't like... I, I definitely prefer when you're listening to old retro tunes that aren't normally presented this way. And it's just a lot more peaceful and it's a lot more, it just feels more magical to me, that era, yeah. th that segment of the show, rather. Now, let me ask you, have you been to, like, other video game orchestra concerts before? Because um, I've been to Zelda Symphony of the Goddesses three times. And then I think that's all that I've been to. Uh, unfortunately, no. I, I, I did have plans to go to video games live once upon a time. <laughs> really? I didn't yeah. know this. But in hindsight, it's kind of funny because Tommy Tallarico is now a, the butt of the joke and just a <laughs> terrible human being. Yeah. <laughs> I, I feel like I just have to address this at once in the podcast because I did address this in the, um, how I got into gaming video, but I want to address it right now again. There have okay. been many okay. times in my Let's Plays that I have said that, like, I like Tommy Tallarico because he's in this show and this is his music from, you know, because he did the music for Spider-Man 2000. He did the music for uh, Sonic and the Black Knight. A lot of these things that, you know, and again, he was a TV host that I enjoyed watching because he was charismatic and funny and I laughed at him a lot, you know. There's a lot of stuff you don't know about the guy when you don't look into it. And I didn't really look into Tommy Tallarico all that much. Mm -hmm. And then uh, H-Bomb dropped his incredibly scathing video about Tommy Tallarico. And that was just like, oh. Incredibly amazing video if you have not oh, seen yes. it. If you have not seen um, the OOF video from H-Bomb, as well as the um, plagiarism video, <laughs> um, watch those now. <laughs> They're really great pieces of media, but I could go on about them forever anyway. So I just want it out there. If you're listening to this podcast, I am aware of Tommy Tallarico, the real Tommy Tallarico. But you, <laughs> but you have to understand, I have had decades worth of history of watching him on Electric Playground. And so I had this weird attachment to the guy because I love that show so much. But I understand and I will not support or prop him up in any way ever again <laughs> yeah it's just it, it it's weird when you have an interest in gaming and there are so many personalities you watch and then something goes wrong and then it's revealed that maybe the personality you watched wasn't all that great of a guy you know and it happens so often in gaming. It happens so often with YouTubers and the G4 hosts. G there are so many G4 hosts who are just terrible people. <laughs> you don't need to tell me this. I'm a wrestling fan. Oh. <laughs> this shit happens like once every other month. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, kids. The world's very problematic, as you'll find out. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the heroes you're looking up to now are probably going to be outed as assholes later it's a very problematic world where capitalism greed and money will always be favored and it will always be a thing instead of actual art and actual effort and actual hard work being propped up and it's just a really 
it's a really big shame that this kind of thing happens like in entertainment and in video games and whatever all the time and we have to face like this reality and stuff yeah such as that i mused when unfortunately we had the dishonor to watch sony's latest disaster <laughs> adam <laughs> webb <laughs> what a beautiful segue what a beautiful beautiful segue <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, do we have any closing thoughts on Sonic Symphony other advice? <laughs> no. It, Sonic Symphony is great. If it's going to tour near you, please go see it. Um, yeah, go see it if you have not already. <laughs> but if you have seen it already, let us know what you thought of it and which songs were your favorites. Absolutely. But yeah, uh, while in Toronto, we wanted to watch something at the movie theater because we had time to kill. And what came out on February 14th, Valentine's Day, but the greatest movie ever, Madame Web. Oh, no. <laughs> Even my cocktail couldn't save me from this one. Yeah. This movie was garbage. <laughs> And I'm, and you know me, I am normally a connoisseur of things that are so bad, they're good, and you can get some form of, like, laughter out of them. That's why we went to see it. Yeah, but we didn't get that, though. <laughs> <laughs> well, except for one thing, but we'll probably re elaborate on that later. Nah, for sure, but uh, <laughs> we were hoping this was going to be, like, Morbius goofy or just, just some kind of goofy, just some kind of bad goofy, and nah, it's just bad. <laughs> no, it's and it's not like I expected it to be good. The whole reason I went no. is because I thought it was gonna be so bad it's good. Like I thought it was just gonna be something we was we could laugh at, and it was to an extent. But because like I just think it's so lame, so lame that Sony, in order to keep hype for Spider Man, they keep coming up with all of these stupid spinoffs that don't have Spider Man in them. Just so they can be like, look, we're building a cinematic universe. We have the Spider-Verse. Because after this is going to be Craven the Hunter. They're going to make Craven the Hunter come out and he's going to have his own movie. As if that's a character who can stand alone. And I think Venom 3 is coming out later this year, I believe. Venom 3? Yeah. Venom 3. Yep. I'm sure they're going to have a friggin' Shocker movie. And we'll chase him to the ends of the earth. But... Yeah, Madam Web is just like, well, this is connected to Spider-Man and we can use the IP, so let's just do an origin story for Madam Web in case Tom Holland ever has to consult her. I don't know. <laughs> I can't wait to see Tom Holland consulting Dakota Johnson about what to do about the supervillains he has to go up against. You know, Mr. Parker, I was there when you were born. I was at the <laughs> hospital when they rushed Uncle Ben to the hospital. <laughs> That's the weirdest yeah. development. Like, Peter Parker's in this movie, technically. Technically. He is. <laughs> because Madame Webb's character is best friends with Uncle Ben, Ben Parker. And she kind of alludes to his death at the beginning of the movie. <laughs> yeah. Like, what, do you want to get shot? And I was like, I could not believe that was a line in there. <laughs> this is only the first ten minutes of the movie. We're not even at the shit of it. <laughs> I get it, because Uncle Ben gets shot. Ha ha. <laughs> Jesus Christ. This movie's awful. <laughs> so, Madame Webb is a character who is always just this oracle, like, crazy weird, you know guide in spider-man i think i've only really seen her in two things outside of the comics which was the animated series and the opening and ending to like spider-man shattered dimensions if anyone played that game otherwise i don't think madame webb is that big of a player and i don't really care that much about the character at all yeah she, she's an oracle she's a guide she she guides spider-man that's all you need to know i don't think she needs her own movie yeah, and somehow they made this into, like, a two-hour movie. <laughs> so we got poor Dakota Johnson just saying these horrible, horrible lines where she just has to, like, deal with all these visions that are being put into her head because she was born of a weird spider cult in the Amazon in Peru or something. Yeah. Ah, oh, the villain. I love the villain of this movie because he's such a bad actor. 
that was the only enjoyable part of this movie was everything that came out of the act the villain's mouth it got to the point where anytime he came on screen i knew i was ready to laugh i knew something funny was going to happen because there is just something so unnatural about this guy where he is always monologuing his evil plan and monologuing <laughs> what he wants to do he takes this woman to bed so he can get like access to his to the cia's crazy security system so that they could spy on everything in new york and see everything everywhere because uh, he got bitten by a spider, or he got the spider powers. So he's kind of like an evil Spider-Man, I suppose. Yeah. And he has a vision that all of these spider women are going to fight him in the future and kick his ass. And this is the only time that you see <laughs> Sidney Sweeney and all the other actresses in full costume yep. doing Spider-Woman stuff and kicking ass like it's a superhero movie or something. I don't know. <laughs> The, the only, only time, time you see it in the movie is when he flashes back to the vision he has of the future of when he's going to get his ass kicked and he's going to be dropped out of a building. <laughs> and you would think that, like, okay, the, I guess the movie's going to build up to this moment. Yeah. But it doesn't. It never does. It never It does. never happens. It doesn't show up. <laughs> nope. So... He's taken this woman to bed, and he's and he's just had sex with her, and he's also, I think, just poisoned her or something. Yeah. So, he's fine monologuing his evil plan and why he took her to bed so that he could get access. And this is the cadence of his performance. He's just like, I will use your power to get into the CIA's mainframe, <laughs> and then I will spy on everything in the world, because I had a vision of the future in which three spider women killed me. I want to prevent my death. I'm going to kill them before they get to me. <laughs> that is honest to God, yeah. the performance. <laughs> so there'll be moments where him and his little assistant girl are spying on things and they just amazingly have the greatest track record. They just know instantly where everyone's going to be at any given moment because this technology is just magic. Yeah. <laughs> Who was that woman who, who saved those girls from you? Who is she? It doesn't matter. She's not important. What's important are the girls. <laughs> I must kill them for the good of my visions. <laughs> I I literally told Clement that, like, he sounded like some cheesy-ass, like, Sailor Moon dick dub villain. <laughs> that vibe. It really was. And, and it, it's just baffling like i was laughing that's the hardest i laughed during the whole movie was just at that guy because his delivery was just so abnormal and so strange and you know he's the main villain of the movie so <laughs> this is a big failure that he's not that good yeah but then the whole movie is just like well dakota johnson knows these girls are going to be killed so she has to try and snatch him away and she uses her visions to know that okay She's going to get her neck snapped by evil Spider-Man in the diner here. So I'm going to just get them out. And then she gets them out and there's no problem. <laughs> the cinematography also just... was just bad. Yeah. It felt like there were just so many cuts and cuts and cuts and cuts and cuts. Yeah, it was very uh, strangely edited at times. Yeah. Yes. The problem with the movie is that most of it is just like Dakota Johnson leading these girls away from the bad guy. And then for some reason, something goes wrong where it's like, okay, she leads the three girls into the woods. Like there's no security cameras here. Not that she would know that. Cause she, like she wouldn't know her, the, the, the bad guy has this crazy surveillance system, but she does, I guess. And she leads them to the woods and she's like, stay here for a few hours while I figure out what's going on. And they're like, wait, for, you can't just leave us here in the woods for hours. She's just met these girls for the first time, like, for an hour. She, like, oh, she yeah. just met them. And then, like, it's not even, like, 15 minutes where it's just, like, the one girl has eaten all of the food they had. She's eaten all yeah. the snacks, all the chocolate bars, all the chips, and she's like, I'm still hungry. <laughs> it's like, what do you mean you're still hungry? You just ate all this food. And so they're like, well, I know there's a diner over there. We should leave this spot and go over to the diner. And of course, they go to a diner, and someone recognizes them, and 
Oh, that's the other thing. Like the Daily Bugle was already reporting on like the the cop who got injured and all this mayhem that happened the first time, even though it just happened and it's the same day. Oh yeah. Like I don't think they would publish this story until the following day, especially if it takes place in the two thousands. Like, what do you mean? <laughs> it's boring and it doesn't make any sense and strange actor cameos in this thing where like Emma Roberts is in this thing. Oh yeah, I forgot that she was in it. <laughs> Emma Roberts plays Spider Man's mom. Like Adam Scott, who you might know from Parks and Recreation, is like Uncle Ben in this, even though he doesn't really have much screen time. And the only reason he's Uncle Ben is because they have to have some connection to Spider Man. Get it? It's Uncle Ben. <laughs> and so oh, this is another amazing thing. They, they, they at some point brought the girls to hang out at Uncle Ben's while she was in Peru because she wanted to find out the origins of this visions she was getting and stuff. And and she managed to hide them with Uncle Ben for like a week or so. So whatever this guy's surveillance system, whatever this guy's CIA and magic operating system, he couldn't find the girls at Uncle Ben's. And they never went out that for food other, or anything. That was the other thing. You reminded me. Thank you. That was the other thing that I got irrationally angry about, which made okay. no sense. So if she's on, if she's like being hunted on right now, and like she's a suspect, she's been on the Daily Bugle, and people are looking for her. Oh, How the right, fuck right. did she get through TSA post 9 11? Because this movie takes place in 2003. How yeah, the fuck yeah. did she get through TSA without getting arrested at all? <laughs> like, what? <laughs> You mean to tell me that she got through security? She got through JFK or whatever airport she flew out of New York unharmed and without any suspicion. And she got on a plane to Lima and traveled some distance to the Amazon with no suspicion. I call bullshit on that. That's <laughs> bullshit. <laughs> yeah, I didn't even think about that either. <laughs> it's just like, oh, yeah, they just let her on the plane. OK, whatever. But it's like. The girls have been hiding at Uncle Ben's for a week, and then, uh, Miss Parker's water breaks. Oh no, she's having birth. She's she's gonna give birth to Spider Man, and all the girls decide. Well, we're gonna go with her. We're gonna go with her to the hospital. And it's like, why? Why don't you just hang out in the building? I know it's a magical moment because this woman's giving birth or whatever. But it's a magical moment. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know. <laughs> oh. Every time anyone has a kid, it's magical, whatever. <laughs> That's lovely one way to put it. But it's like, well, you don't need to be there because Uncle Ben will be with her. And it just Uncle Ben and her. That's all they need. And still all three of the girls go with. And then as soon as they get down traffic, they're, in, they're not even in the hospital. They're just in traffic. They're at a car stop, a stoplight. Identified. Oh, they're over here. Go get them, villain. <laughs> it's like, come on. <laughs> it's a bad movie. <laughs> I'm so sorry, Sydney. You couldn't save this movie for me. <laughs> I'll stick with you in Euphoria. <laughs> <laughs> like, like people wouldn't want to see her in that Spider Woman outfit for most of the movie. Like, That's what are you doing? That's what I'm saying. You have Sydney Sweeney here. And you don't put her in the suit for an extended shot at all. <laughs> <laughs> She's wearing tight leather and she's barely wearing it? What do you mean? That's how you get the box office money! Sony, <laughs> what are you thinking? <laughs> What's wrong with you? <laughs> that should be like bullet point number one. That should be the movie. It's just these spider women kicking ass, you know? And yes. no, that's not the movie. It's just a bunch of teenagers running away from the worst actor in the world. Look up a villain compilation of this guy, like... Look up the, yes. the, the villain of this yes. movie, because that's the most entertainment you're going to get out of, the, out of the film, frankly. It's just sad. I think Madame Web is like the worst rated like movie out of the Sony universe ones that have come out. I think it did worse than um, Morbius. Probably. That, that wouldn't surprise me at all. Which is a shame, you know, but it's like, it's just a bunch of corporations just holding on to licenses. And they're like, well, we got to hold on to the Spider-Man license, so we got to make a movie. Uh, we'll just do spinoffs of the character. Madam Web, Morbius, ha ha ha. But it's so shallow and it's so just, you know why these movies are being made. And the reason these movies are being made is just for corporate greed and not for actual entertainment. 
Like, they could have made the Spider-Verse interesting if Morbius was fun, or, and, and, and Madam Web was fun, but you know these movies aren't going to be fun, because you just look at the trailers and you know it's going to be crap. You know it's going to be lame. And then people are going to say, see, this is why there shouldn't be, like, women leading superhero movies. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> Y'all gotta apologize to the Marvels right now. Because that movie was so much better than Madam Web. Yeah. So I'd rather waste money on better things out there, like I did in the first couple of months of this year, where I spent money on some damn good RPGs. Yeah. And Yakuza Infinite Wealth, that is an infinite load of fun, and it is very well worth my money. I am still playing it as of this recording, um, but I'm near the end-ish. I love your Segway game. You're getting really good at it. <laughs> oh, am I? <laughs> <laughs> the way you transition from topic to topic is just mwah, perfect. Well, Amazing. let me handle them from now on. Okay, you will. You shall. I don't even need to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the decider. But yes, uh, Like a Dragon, Infinite Wealth came out, and I did get that. I, I guess I'll start up front by saying, like, we. I don't think we've really... We have talked about Yakuza in the past, because I remember we, we were talking about Yakuza Zero and Yakuza Kiwami, um, mm -hmm. maybe in, like, podcast three or four. Like, it's been a while. But no. uh, I have gone through the majority of the series. The only Yakuza games I haven't really played are Ishin, which I own, and I'll get to it when my backlog accounts for it, you know? No. Uh, and I haven't played... The man who erased his name, or the man with no name, or, you know, the newest... The man who erased his name. The man, the newest Kiryu adventure, basically. Um, those are the only two I haven't played. I've played Judgment, I've played uh, Dead Souls, the zombie game on PS3. Uh, I've played all of them. I've played every single one up to this point. So I know the legacy of Kiryu, and I know his whole life story... Uh, which is interesting as a contrast to you, because you've played Yakuza 0, which is the beginning of this franchise, mm -hmm. chronologically speaking. Yes. So you're more of a newcomer, and you're more familiar with Ichiban, I would say, than yes. Kiryu's Adventures. Yes, which is another common pathway for people who... Um have gotten into the Like a Dragon series lately. So one pathway you could take is play through Yakuza 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and do the whole thing with Kiryu. Um, another pathway that I've seen recommended and it, I think is just as viable is just starting with Like a Dragon because technically it is the new story with the new character and then go on from there. Yeah. So in a legacy sense, I appreciate Yakuza 0. It's actually one of my favorite games ever because um, of... The main story, the side quests, the personality of it is awesome. Um, but Infinite Wealth is a direct sequel to Like a Dragon. So if you want to jump into Infinite Wealth, I would say at the very least, play Yakuza Like a Dragon first and then um, go into Infinite Wealth. Yeah, it, it's weird. It, it acts sort of like a continuation of this new era of like the Ichiban Kasuga uh, saga. But it's also like a send off for Kiryu. It seems to be the yeah. the swan song of this character because it's like, I mean, we've always been trying to build up to like Kiryu's story being over. Yakuza Six was definitely leaning towards this being like Kiryu's last adventure, and and in his, you know, spoilers for Like a Dragon, but he does show up at some point to save and help <gasps> uh, Kasuga, which is which was unexpected. Because genuinely, the way Yakuza 6 ends, you think he's just going to walk off into the sunset and maybe we're not going to see that character ever again. And then we get to the RPG and there he is. He shows up and he saves Ichiban at some point. And then, of course, they announced the man who erased his name and all this other stuff. And now he's in the newest game. So it's like, OK, I guess <laughs> Kiryu's not done after all. <laughs> no. I guess he's still around. Um, we always thought of like these RPGs, like the fact that it transitioned from action gameplay to turn-based RPGs, it just felt like a new era was unfolding, a new era, and if we wanted action-style stuff, that's what the Judgment games were for. But then I think the Judgment games had a bit of a controversy going on with their actors, and now I think they're, I think they're giving up on a Judgment. I might be wrong about that. Yeah. Point is, you know, it felt like Kiryu had a send-off. 
And now Infinite Wealth feels like especially more of a send off, more of like we're passing the torch to Ichiban. We're definitely giving this character the goodbye that he really deserved in Yakuza 6, especially with the side quests tied into Kiryu's whole part of the game. Yep. He's running into familiar faces. He's remembering things from the past seven or so games. He's remembering this and he's doing this and he's doing that. And this feels like a bigger, you know, goodbye, let's say, uh, for the Kiryu yeah, character. Yeah, there's a particular circumstance that holds over Kiryu in um, Infinite Wealth. And based on the side quest that you do with this character in particular, a lot of it makes sense. Yeah. And I think I'm getting more out of it than you are, but I don't, I don't know if you're still appreciating uh, those side stories. Oh, no, stories. it's very... I appreciate the depth of it, at least, because, like... So I haven't played through all of the original mainline Yakuza games, but I've gotten, like, bits and pieces of it. Yeah. Whether it was, like, I don't know, watching Super Eye Patch Wolf talk about it, or um, watching, I don't know, a couple of friends talk about it, or watch a clip for here or there. So, like, I get it in bits and pieces... But it's not like, for me, it's a whole streamed out experience. Um, but it's still really cool seeing like all these callbacks, how much love they've put into the character and the story of Kiryu. Um, so I've been enjoying what I've been getting out of them. Yeah. You know, it, it, it's just interesting to kind of cap off Kiryu's life and to see what he's learned throughout everything he's been through from Yakuza 0 up to this point and to see how he reflects upon it and how everyone feels about him. It, like, this is feels way more final than Yakuza 6 because we actually get to hear everyone's opinions on Kiryu and how they, how much th he's impacted their lives and why they me he means so much to them. Uh, which is heartwarming, and it tugs at your heartstrings, and it makes you shed a little tear. Um... <laughs> And again, that's just one aspect of this game, because I'm, I'm selling it like this is one big Kiryu send-off, but this is also a Hawaiian adventure. Ichiban leaves Japan to go to Honolulu City, and uh, he's, in an Amer <laughs> he's in America for this whole entire game, trying to solve more wacky conspiracies involving criminalized groups, you know. Yes, technically, he is in the United States, and I kind of want to, like, before we dive into Ichiban's like whole thing, um, I kind of want to like dive back to what you said about Kiryu, and I think we had a conversation about this maybe like last week. And I think part of the reason why um, Kiryu is in Yakuza Like a Dragon and in this game is because like you know when you're shifting a story and shifting a franchise from one character to another character, you're not sure how fans are going to feel about that. The fans might love this character. The fans might hate where the direction is going. We've seen a lot of franchises and media where, like, all sorts of reactions happen. Yeah. So I think part of the reason why Kiryu had a presence and has a presence in this game is where it's like, okay, well, we're sure we're confident in this new character, Ichiban, but, like, you know, we understand that Kiryu resonates with a lot of our older audience, so why not have a mix of these two? But Ichiban's been received really well, and honestly, he's one of my favorite video game protagonists ever. I just love his personality and how he, like, interacts with the world and how he's so silly, but yet he'll throw shit down if you mess with, like, one of his friends or family members. Yeah. And so I think now with Infinite Wealth, it's like, okay, now it's finally time to, like, really dive in with Ichiban. Everyone's loving him. Let's really nail down what his whole story is this time. See if you get what I'm talking about with that. No, no, absolutely, absolutely. Like, uh, again, I loved Like a Dragon. I thought it was a fantastic RPG. Uh, the ending got me teary-eyed. Like, the whole ending at the lockers... I guess I spoiled this location, but... <laughs> <laughs> the whole ending and the big monologue that Ichiban has, where he has got tears in his eyes and he's just, like, emoting... Like, so hard, I just, I remember thinking, like, Jesus Christ, this is a good ending. It reminded me so much of the Kiryu Nishiki scene in the woods in Yakuza 0. Yeah. Like, it was, he was just pouring his heart out, and it was such good acting, and I was just like, fuck, what an ending. What an ending to this amazing RPG, good lord. And yeah, it, it just, it was fantastic, and I feel like Infinite Wealth does a lot of great changes to the combat system that makes it a little yes. more strategic, a little more interesting. 
Uh, it's still got all the job classes that it had before, plus a whole bunch of new ones that are very Hawaiian in inspired. So you have uh, the Aquanaut, where someone is a surfer and they kill people with a surfboard. Um, you got the, the, the hulu dancers kind of stuff where they're wearing the hula skirts and the coconut bra and they're shaking their maracas and doing all kinds of magics that way. Um. <laughs> <laughs> and then you have some that like aren't exactly related to the tropical setting, but are new jobs regardless. So there's um, an action movie star that you can be where you have like a ton of action moves. You can be a cowboy where you can shoot. Oh, I love that um, one. That one was people. Great. Yeah, th I have I have Ichiban equipped with that job now, actually. Um, I wasn't Ichiban with that, but I gave it to Adachi. I thought Adachi, because nice. he's security guard, he's like, he's the, he's the cop. He's got to have the guns. Come on. <laughs> nice. <laughs> and he just has so many. I love so many abilities from that because like he can shoot this bottle of water at them, which not only does water damage, but it also has the chance of poisoning them. So yeah. It's splash damage, it hits a big group of people, and it can potentially poison. I love it. <laughs> you can be like this assassin ninja. <laughs> Kunoichi. Because I'm doing a video on Mortal Kombat, it just kind of took me off guard how much she looks like Scorpion when she's dressed like that. <laughs> <laughs> like, oh my god, she looks like a Mortal Kombat character, Jesus. Oh, you can be a housemaid? Yeah, that was actually one of the better jobs, too. She'll literally pull out two irons to burn people with fire damage. And yes, this may sound strange if you're not familiar with the previous Yakuza Like a Dragon RPG, but Ichiban is a very special character who views the world as if it was Dragon Quest. Yes. And so every time he comes up to a group of enemies, they will transform into more wacky personas of themselves, where they might be wearing garbage bags... Or they might be, like, homeless shamans with a big staff who shoot magic at you. Or there might be these big fat guys who have a giant pizza as a shield. Or they might be, like, evil botanists that throw weird pollen at you. Oh, I hate those guys. Those guys are assholes. Oh, no, these are horrible. <laughs> so, like, Ichiban's imagination transforms this super serious crime drama into a Dragon Quest style turn-based RPG with lots of uh, elemental things where, you know, even your, your friends and allies are doing wacky stuff that they obviously aren't doing. Like, I doubt <laughs> that Tomizawa is actually beating someone up with a surfboard. I doubt. Oh, yeah. <laughs> even though you do buy the equipment. But... <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> I doubt he's actually surfing across the road and you know, kicking their ass and, and using dolphins, like summoning a dolphin to just like <laughs> drive kick someone in the face or whatever. He's not <laughs> actually doing a flipper to the lipper. He's not doing a flipper to the lipper. No, no. <laughs> mm. Sadness. He's not actually taking a bunch of pliers and then using it on a car battery to shoot electricity at you. Okay. So your housemate is not actually burning people with um, flattening irons. No, no, I don't think so. And again, maybe. I don't know. There are some wacky bosses near the end of this game. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying, when you finish up Ichiban's uh, final chapter, there, there's a boss there that's a little ridiculous. And I'm wondering how much of that is his imagination or is this actually ridiculous happening? Ridiculous in a good way or ridiculous in like, oh, this is ridiculous. I had stupid. fun. I loved it. I thought okay. it was stupid, goofy fun. But it's also just like, are we, sh did Yakuza actually do this? But then again, you know what? You know what? Yakuza 4 had a side quest that involved a mythological creature. That's all I'm going to say. That's all I'm going to say. Okay. Okay. <laughs> It, right. Yaku, if it's if it's okay for Yakuza 4, the game in which there was no crazy imagination turn-based combat, then I'm sure it's good enough for the rest of the series. So, I'll take your word for it. <laughs> <laughs> Honolulu is huge. Like it's a huge map and there's a lot to do and there's like a lot of beach space. Um I love the new characters. Um I think they're really great foils um to what Ichiban's experiencing um, in Hawaii. And minigame wise, there's always, you know, it's it's like a dragon. There's so much to play. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you can make deliveries on bike. 
you can photograph people while you're riding on a trolley. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, and, and and in those two instances, we have to mention that, like, yeah, we're doing, like, crazy eats, crazy eats delivery, where you're on a bike, and you have to get to these people in a time limit, and you have to do these cool, sick tricks in order for the delivery to be, to get a better payout bonus. Like, super crazy delivery! Super crazy delivery! This is crazy taxi as hell. Like, the guy yeah. you do the mission for has a red shirt and green hair, just like the guy from Crazy Taxi. <laughs> And then again, this is a Sega franchise, so that's not shocking. That's not like the craziest thing in the world. But there's also a lot of Nintendo-inspired minigames this time around that are really tapping into that library of games. Because when you say like you're taking photos, like the Sicko Snap stuff, yeah, the Sicko that snap. is just straight up Pokemon Snap. Like you, you get on this trolley, and there's all these like weird perverts and weird creepy weirdos who are just wearing thongs. <laughs> I swear to God, this is real. And yep, they're all true. bald and they're all naked. And you're just like on this trolley going through the city and taking pictures of them when they come up and trying to get, trying to snap them all. You're trying to snap them all. Yeah, I'm trying to snap them all. <laughs> Speaking of Pokemon, there is, um, so enemies you encounter in this game are called Sujimon. And technically every time you encounter an enemy, like you get a new entry in your Sujimon, like, decks or whatever they call it. Yeah. But in Infinite Wealth, you can actually pit your Sujimon against other people like it's Pokemon. And there's a whole <laughs> Sujimon League with Sujimon stops like it's Pokemon Go. And you can feed your Sujimon to make them get stronger. You have to take out the discrete four. Not the Elite Four, yeah. the Discrete the Four. Discrete Four. And you got to get their badges. <laughs> so yes, Infinite Wealth actually has a Pokemon sub-story, and it's a, a whole dedicated thing where every enemy you've come across has the potential to be recruited by you, and only instead of using a Pokeball, Ichiban gives them, like, gifts. <laughs> yeah, like a box of gifts. He gives them, like, a, a, a box of uh, valuables, a box of treats and stuff. And you have to mash the button really, really hard to see if they'll accept your gracious invitation to join their party. And sometimes they'll kick the box away, which is disappointing. And other times they'll be like, yeah, I'll join up with you. Yeah. <laughs> but it's like every single enemy is like, you know, element based where they're either fire, water, grass or light and shadow. And the idea is yeah, it's, it's like Pokemon. It's like rock, paper, scissors. You're just trying to get like the advantage over them, where if there's a water-type enemy that you're taking on, then bring out the grass-type Sujimon in order to beat them down. And uh, I got pretty much near the end of that whole thing. I didn't finish it. But uh, it, it definitely goes places. It definitely goes places. I also like that they have the, the dojo guy from Yakuza 4 as sort of like your Pikachu. <laughs> <laughs> He's wearing the big yellow gi. Yeah. He kind of looks chubby like Pikachu. He, he's your Pikachu. And he doesn't say Pika Pika. Yeah, he doesn't say Pika Pika, unfortunately. Pika Pika. <laughs> Pikachu. Don't do that again. <laughs> what? What do you mean? No. I don't like the way he said Pikachu. Pikachu. No. <laughs> <laughs> is that is that going in the cursed folder? No, don't put it in the cursed folder. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just put an audio of me going Pikachu, Pikachu, and it'll go in the cursed folder. It sounds like you're driving a white truck full of candy around the neighborhood. <laughs> hey kids, want to see Pikachu? <laughs> just come into my creepy van. <laughs> oh my gosh <laughs> <laughs> but also so not only do they have pokemon not just pokemon snap but also just a dedicated pokemon system but they also have don doko island so this game not only was able to fit pokemon snap and pokemon they fit animal crossing <laughs> into infinite wealth 2 and don doko island is such a time sink oh, in a good God. way it's very addicting. Yeah. 
Like, you're going to be spending hours finishing that thing, because it's like, somehow Ichiban manages to meet a whole bunch of weird mascot people who kind of look like Animal Crossing characters themselves, because, you know, what's the premise of Animal Crossing? It's a human interacting with a whole bunch of animals, but you can't do that in Yakuza, so what do they do? Oh, it's a bunch of mascots! He's just interacting with a whole bunch of mascots. And he's on an island... And it used to be a four-star resort hotel kind of place. And unfortunately, some jerky pirates started polluting the place and throwing their garbage all over the place. So yep. you have to clear out the garbage, and then you have to build all kinds of stuff with a crafting bench. And you build the, ridic- the most ridiculous, gigantic things that I can't believe Ichiban is building. Where you're building entire buildings and gold statues and cars and stuff like that. Yep. Yep. And you're basically just trying to raise the comfortability, the popularity, and the excitement to this place so that people will want to check it out, so that it will become a one-star, two-star, three-star, four-star, five-star resort. And uh, you can customize it any way you want. You can have houses arranged anywhere you want. You can pave the roads to just just go wherever you want the roads to go and it's it's just animal crossing it's just straight up animal crossing it's it's i don't know how else to describe it it's animal crossing but with yakuza a very interesting crossover in theory <laughs> <laughs> it's just it's just wacky to me how the more these games go on the more they start incorporating all of these franchises like and not just sega but like nintendo franchises like, in the last game, in Like a Dragon, they had a fucking Mario Kart minigame. Yeah. You could literally race on the cars. Like, it's a whole Mario dedicated cart. cart system with, like, tons of racetracks and stuff. Like, you could customize the carts and everything. Like, they had a whole Mario Kart thing in the last game. Uh, I just, I'm always baffled and, but also happy that... The Yakuza games always happen to have these crazy, gigantic things on the side that you don't need yeah. to do. You don't need to do it, but it's there, and it's so friggin' fun. <laughs> it's insane. It's wacky. <laughs> and you get, like, a lot of good, like, bits of war, or maybe some fun info out of, like, doing them, that it just really ties the whole experience together. Like, there's definitely, like, more hours you can clock into all the side content versus, like, the main story. I would say. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I, I I couldn't even imagine just doing the main content in a Yakuza game, though. It's like, yeah. the side content is so freaking good in all of these games. To me, the Yakuza franchise is like the gold standard when it comes to side quests. Because yes. I will be playing Yakuza 6, and it seems like a straightforward story about a guy looking for a certain person, and... All of a sudden, he joins a baseball league, and now I'm playing baseball with the boys. <laughs> yeah. Now he's going deep sea diving, so I can go hunt some sharks and shit. <laughs> it's such. And then in other games, and then in other games, you own a club, or maybe you're a taxi driver. Oh, or the cabaret club is brilliant. I love the cabaret club. Cabaret club is is so good; it should be its own game. Like yes. I want this. I second this, that developer studio to just make a cabaret club game and maybe expand it a little bit give it extra things to do and just like make that its own game that you buy for like 20 bucks 13 bucks or something like i don't know but god that playing that in yakuza zero i got addicted to it i just kept playing it and playing it and playing it and it was the best way to get money for majima uh it was just insane it was crazy how much money you could make in one session oh yeah (laughs) <laughs> oh yeah you can make millions why make millions when you can make billions mm. <laughs> they still have arcade machines so you can go play sega bass fishing and some weird sega games i've never heard of before like spike out and stuff no i've never played spike out yeah that was the first time i played it the vocational school where you do trivia is so funny I nailed the Sega ones on my first try. I didn't need to do them twice at all. I just nailed those. Yeah. Flowers took me like four or five tries, though. I couldn't get flowers down at all. I got flowers in one try. Oh, 
I am a trivia master. <laughs> a lot of these I got in either one or two tries. <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry. I like I like trivia. <laughs> it's neat. I, it, it's it's a good flex to say that you're smart and you can you can solve trivia. I mean, I'm not complaining. You just gotta up your ante with underworld studies if you want to get that courage. Because you got to build all that stuff up again. Poor Ichiban. He's had a bad year. <laughs> he got exposed by a VTuber. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's literally the plot of the game. Or at least how it starts. Yeah. <laughs> I was dying. I was loving that the premise of the game, the reason everything's gone to shit since the last adventure, is that Ichiban's trying to reform a whole bunch of Yakuza. Now that the whole Yakuza system has been kind of upended after, after the last game, like, the Yakuza are no longer what they once were. And people are trying to reintegrate themselves into society, and Ichiban's trying to help them do it. But yeah. this gets exposed by a VTuber who filmed them and filmed them doing some kind of sketchy stuff like shoplifting in order to prove that something was easily shopliftable. You know, it was, it was for a good cause, but it was kind of sketchy. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the other thing I like about um, this game is that um, I believe this game takes place in 2023. Yeah. So there are mentions of real world stuff. So the pandemic is mentioned in this game. Yeah. Yeah. And it has consequences on real world stuff. So I just thought that was fascinating. No, I, I, I like the whole premise of the game because it was just like. Ichiban is being taken down for something that, like, is not nearly as bad as it seems. And the idea of, of like, this mob cancel culture kind of system and how, like, Ichiban is being, you know, demonized and treated as, like, this horrible villain by a, an internet personality when they don't really have the full scope or the full story of what exactly no. was going on and how, like, you know, that's all it takes. It's just an internet personality can somehow completely ruin your life and get and make you lose your job and stuff like he was working at hello work and then this vtuber completely ruined that <laughs> he got fired immediately oh yeah and also the the poor situation with psycho where he, he has feelings for psycho this development since the last game he's got feelings for psycho and he, he's really into her and she agrees to go on a date with him and he's cheering he's like yeah i did it i did it <laughs> dancing with all the homeless people yeah <laughs> but then ichiban being ichiban of course he decides to propose to her on the first date <laughs> yeah <laughs> and she ghosts him for a year <laughs> i just like how his bros are like Yo, why did you do that? That's pretty dumb. Yeah. <laughs> and they try to explain to him why that's not a great thing. Yeah, it's not like he thinks he did the right thing or he thinks it was nothing wrong. It was just like, everyone's just like, dude, you proposed on the first date? Why the hell would you do that? <laughs> Even Kiryu's just like, what, really? Why, why would you do that? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I, I liked Hawaii as a location. I thought that was really cool. I like the fact that you can go on to the beach and just like... Start swimming in the water and start diving for junk yeah. in the mm -hmm. water so you can hand it to this lady who will, like, take care of all that junk for you and give you points to get other prizes and stuff. But it's just it's just such a cool location and it's just so nice and sunny and it was just a nice change of pace from how Yakuza locations typically are. It's usually just a, a bright city location, some kind of city. It's nice to have that formality of, like, the games taking place in, like, one thing or another, but... Yeah. You know, it's a nice twist to have it in, like, Hawaii. I'd like to see the next, like, a dragon game take place, like, I don't know, in New York. Oh, or God. Philadelphia. Or <laughs> London. I don't know. <laughs> Let's just go up to the snowy mountains of Canada. Why not? <laughs> the, the story and the cutscenes, they get crazy. There are lots of bizarre fucking twists that you don't see coming. I, I kind of like how all the new party members all start out as enemies at first. It, it kind of makes yeah. me think of like Guardians of the Galaxy, where everyone's kind of got a, a twisted moral center. Everyone's kind of got like a, 
they're on the wrong side of history in a skeevy way, but then Ichiban's enthusiasm and his determination and his just upstanding conviction just wins them all over, and they all just start becoming better people because of Ichiban, you know? You know, I never thought of it that way with Ichiban, but a lot of that makes sense. I like that. Well, I, I just think that's the whole central thing of his character is, like, he starts the game off yeah. trying to reform Yakuza. Like, there's that one guy who's, like, like this blowhard asshole who's trying to bribe Ichiban. He's just like, come on, I got money. Just take my money and help me out already. And Ichiban won't do it. He's just like, nope, sorry. I don't help people who think they can just buy their ways, buy their way into things. I, I'm not helping you there. Yeah. And then the guy pours his heart out and explains that he's got a family and he's got all this stuff. And Ichiban goes, okay, there you go. That's what I wanted to see. I'll help you out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And he's, he's, he's always fixing things. He's always just like making things better for people who genuinely put in the effort to better themselves, I feel. Yeah, absolutely. Like Tomizawa and Chitose start out like Tomizawa pulls a gun on you. Chitose drugs you and leaves you naked on the beach. <laughs> like everyone is out for self. Everyone is out for self and they think there's no hope or there's no way anything good will ever happen here in Hawaii. Things are fucked. It's never going to get better. And Ichiban just shows them that no, it can be better. You can totally leave Yamai and it's going to work out, man. Don't worry. We'll kick their asses. We're gonna, we, everything's gonna be okay. Just join me, and uh, I like that. I think that's fun. It it, yeah. it it adds an element to of his character that's different from Kiryu, where he's just the eager puppy dog who who believes in the best of others, no matter what horrible, awful shit you do. He still believes in you. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you still have the chance to be a better person. I know it. I know you can. Which is maybe naive in the world of the organized crime and in the world of Yakuza and stuff, but yep. hey, that's Ichiban's character. That's who he is. And that's what makes him a fascinating, fascinating protagonist. That's what makes him so likable to me. Yeah. You know, it's so rare to have that personality in like games that have settings like this. And I think it's just a nice foil to like all the other characters that like Ichiban encounters, even in like. The previous game and infinite wealth yeah so it's a great game yes it is definitely check it out but it wasn't the most anticipated rpg of the year no it was not <laughs> not to say that like infinite wealth is bad it's a, it's it's an amazing game i've been having a really good time with it so far i'd be lying if i said that um I wasn't looking forward to Final Fantasy VII Rebirth more than that game. Oh, it's here. It's finally here. So as we know, Final Fantasy VII is one of the most prolific RPGs that's ever existed, and people have been wanting a remake for the longest time. And then in 2020, we finally got the remake, except it wasn't a full remake. It was only part one of a trilogy that they planned on making, and... I have to mention the spoiler of remake because it's in the promotional pr 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 it's in the promotional material. You already know something's up, but like at the end of part one, the characters found themselves fighting things called whispers, which are these ghosts that control destiny. They control the fate of the planet, and when it turns out to be a very meta narrative where the ghosts are trying to keep things the way everything was in the original game. And then we kill them and we erase them and we destroy them. Yep. And then that means that in part two and three, anything can happen. And Zach fair, the character who is a comrade to cloud and the, and the main character of crisis core, which was re-released in between remake and rebirth can come back to life and he is back to life, and he's alive, and we start the game off as him for the first, like, ten minutes in Rebirth. Yep. <laughs> and so we're going into uncharted territory here with part two onwards, where we don't know what's going to happen. We know things are going to be different, but it's ultimately still following the plot points of Final Fantasy VII, and that includes all of the various locations that you go to and uh, 
the Nibelheim retelling where we get to see Cloud explain who exactly the Sephiroth guy is, which would be nice to yep. know before their big climactic battle and remake, but whatever. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I guess if I'm going in a general sense of like, how big is the plot? How far does it go in relation to the original? We're getting all of disc one here. I guess I'll say that. Yeah, basically you're getting the rest of disc one after you leave Midgar. And if you know how disc one ends, mm -hmm. that is uh, very much the big final set piece of this game. But does it play out exactly like it did? That's the thing you're going to have to find out. <laughs> yep. You're going to have to find that out by playing this game. <laughs> but, um... I love this game. <laughs> I love oh, yes. this game so much. Final Fantasy VII Rebirth. I knew it was going to be my game of the year, and it, it. I just don't see anything eclipsing it. This is my game of the year. I know. I feel so bad for Infinite Wealth because I just talked. To, we just talked about how much I love that game. Yeah. But like, I loved my experience of playing Rebirth, and this definitely will be my game of the year. <laughs> I'm just saying, I am just saying, like, I'm sorry, like, I know there's some cool titles coming out later in the year. I wouldn't say as much as I had purchased in 2023, but just what this game does and its story and its gameplay and its side quests and its combat, like, wow. Whole package. It's like, I know it's March and I know it's too early to tell, but I just don't see what game could come out that would eclipse all of the hype amazing moments and the great gameplay and the crazy visuals and the everything that this game is all about like i'm just flabbergasted this game is gigantic compared to remake mm -hmm. if remake is a 40 hour game this is like a 60 to 70 hour game with side quests and and bonus content that pushes it into 100 hours this is like way bigger than Final Fantasy XII, which I thought was, at the time, the biggest Final Fantasy game up to that point. Yeah. Before Rebirth, I would say XII was the biggest Final Fantasy, but now, I think Rebirth's a bigger game than Final Fantasy XII. <laughs> yeah, because that was always my question going into Rebirth, so it's like, okay, so obviously we're out of Midgar, and the game's going to be more, like, open world, just like in the original version. So, like, with current open world mechanics and how that's represented in a lot of AAA titles now, how is Seven Rebirth going to interpret that? And, yeah, there's a, there's a lot. <laughs> there's a lot of content here. <laughs> I was shocked. I was shocked how big the world was. I was shocked how many open world maps there were. Because, like, yep. you've, you've got... The grasslands of the start. You've got Corel. You've got Gongaga. You've got Junon. You've got. It just goes on and on and on. And it just got to the point where I was like, are they just going to remake the whole fucking world in this one game? <laughs> like, I thought we couldn't. I thought the reason this game was being split apart into a trilogy was because this game is too big and we can't do it. But it felt like they were making the game. It felt like the whole of, of the planet was being in this one game. <laughs> I was shocked. Yeah. <laughs> Because you see everything. Like, you go to the Chocobo Farm, you go to Calm, you go to Nibelheim, you go to Junon, not just the under part of Junon, but, like, where the parade and stuff is. And, <laughs> and I loved that location. I love... I'll get into it later, but... Yes. You know, you go to Costa del Sol, you go to the Gold Saucer, you go to Corel, you go to Gangaga, uh... It's crazy how many places you go to, and they're all fully You go realized. to Cosmo Canyon, too. Cosmo Canyon is huge! It's freaking huge! Like, out of all the villages, places you go, I, I was surprised how big Cosmo Canyon was. And I was just like, how is this game still going? <laughs> this game is huge! <laughs> and now we know why it takes two discs to install this game. Oh, yeah. This is 145 <laughs> yeah. gigs. Like, <laughs> you're going to be clearing space in your PS5. I don't know what you're deleting, but you're deleting something because this game is gigantic. Yes. I would say for the most part, the combat is exactly the same as you remember it from Remake, but they do have a lot of cool quality of life things uh, regarding some of their abilities. Like Cloud 
has a lot more ranged attacks this time around, which I'm so thankful for. Like yeah. before I, I criticized the, the air combat in the original game because I just felt like when you're playing with Cloud and Tifa, sometimes enemies, you would just be so hard trying to hit them because it would take like a slight second for them to like jump up where they are. And if the enemy swerved out of the way to do an attack, then you're just swinging at air and missing and doing nothing. And I thought air combat was could have used a little fine tuning in the original. But in remake, um, when Cloud dodges or when you push the dodge button and then you start attacking immediately afterwards, he has blade beams. He shoots blade beams out yeah. of his sword and he shoots a whole <laughs> bunch of lasers into the sky so that you can be a fair distance away from something that's flying around and you can still like hit them with projectiles constantly in order to pressure them and, and drain and raise their stagger beater and stuff. So I feel like there's a lot more versatility there. I feel like Tifa and him jump up way quicker to flying enemies when they got to get into it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, they got a lot of cool new skills that do a lot of awesome damage and a lot of cool tricks. I like um, Barrett's. He's got this thing called bonus round. He like ch charges up his gun and then all of his bullets do extra stagger power. So when you activate bonus round, it actually makes the stagger bar fill up so much quicker that you can like get them into their staggered state a lot faster. Yeah. And of course, along with Aerith, Barrett, Tifa and Cloud, we also have a whole new cast of characters because we get to play around with Yuffie. We get to play around with Kate Sith. And we get to play around with Red 13. He's not just a side character who fights on his own. We get to play as him this time around. You get to play as Red. Yeah. Uh, Yuffie's fantastic. Yuffie is amazing. She's so fun to play as. I like Red in the sense of like, he's very much a berserker type character where yeah. he, he takes damage and it builds up his rage meter, his vengeance mode. Uh, and then when it's full... You just push the button and boom, he's so much stronger. He's so much more vicious. He can do all these skills he can't normally do. Um, he can also siphon people's health and like drain it for himself, which is fun. So um, I feel like Red is really fun. The only character I wasn't jiving with all that much, which is so true to the original, very, very <laughs> authentic to the original experience. Um, I wasn't vibing with Kate Sith all that much. See, they did remake everything. Gosh. <laughs> um, it's exactly yeah. how I remember it. Exactly the original. <laughs> well, yeah, I'm with you there. Like, Yuffie's one of my favorites. Um, I didn't use Red 13 as much as my other party members, but when I did use him, um, I did enjoy what I got out of him. But yeah, Kate's a... Because uh, uh, uh. you have to, like... He needs a to, lot like, of fight setup. as him, but he... Yeah, it's the setup that gets me because you have to fight as him for like a while. But he's not like the other characters where like Cloud and Aerith and Tifa can easily do like a lot of ranged or a lot of close up abilities. And then once you build him up, you have to get on the. You summon like his mechanical Moogle. But then you can't even do like your ATB abilities if you don't have the Moogle on you. So you have to build up ATB anyway to summon the Moogle. Yeah. You know, it's like a whole. Why am I doing this chain? He's one of those characters you got to emphasize ATB on. You got to get a first strike materia on him so that he can get the Moogle instantly. And even then, it's so much of his his play style is based on luck. I mean, obviously, that's that was his gimmick in the original as well. But it's like, it really depends on him having high luck so that he can do a lot of critical hits. And he he rolls dice, and sometimes he'll roll dice and... He'll get a two and it does okay damage, and then he'll get a six and it does good damage. It's it's not consistent and it's not reliable. And there was one ability I liked of his that was really good, though, because it was a Moogle Magic. Um, Moogle Magic takes an ability from the summon that he's personally equipped and he just does it. And you only need like one bar to do it. So like you use one ATB bar and you can summon Bahamut to fucking dive in and just start attacking people. And that's like the best ability of Kate Sith, in my opinion. Um, but when it came to like staggering and other stuff, I just, none of the moves were like jiving with me all that much. I just thought he was a very slow, very awkward, very unorthodox character that I'm sure lots of people are going to love. And I'm sure lots of people are going to figure out the best utility of this character. But from a casual perspective, 
I just don't think he's as fun as as everybody else, personally. You don't like giving everyone the good old knuckle. Nah. That was my favorite part of playing as Kate Sith. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But that's it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, to be fair, it's just the gameplay you're talking about. Because I remember you said yeah. you really liked Kate Sith as a character. No, Kate Sith in this game is fantastic. He's great. But the gameplay-wise, I just wish he was a little better. Yeah, again, the benefits of a remake is that, like, we get to really finally see the potential of what Kate Sith actually is. Because he's a robotic cat, and he's a cute little kitty cat who has a Scottish accent, and he's, you know... When, he, when he's a pixel, when he's like, he's like 3D blocky polygons from the original, the camera's always so far back, you don't really get to see the expressiveness on the cat's face. You don't really get to see him jumping around and doing wacky things on top of the Moogle. But here, he's got so much personality to spare. Like, we get full-on yeah. Kate Sith, as you saw him in Dirge of Cerberus or Advent Children. Like, this is the Kate Sith that he should have been from the very beginning. But with actually great direction from a competent team. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think this game loves its fan service, and I love it for loving fan service because it yes. makes every single event in the game memorable. It makes every single event just a smorgasbord for your eyes, and you're just like, oh my god, I can't believe that happened, and oh my god, this happened, and oh my god, <laughs> that cutscene was incredible. Like, the, yep. I'm, I've been watching a lot of streamers reacting to their first visit to the gold saucer. <laughs> yes. Uh. Where not only do the girls get do a little dance number because they get pulled into a dance number, because why not? But Dio shows up and Dio has always been a character in the original. But here again, because he's not a blocky pixel person, we get to see this muscular, hairy guy doing all these poses and flexing and his fucking titties bounce. <laughs> <laughs> it is so fun watching these characters just come to life and just be the most eccentric, bombastic, crazy things you've ever seen in your life. I just love it. And you're right where you really see the full potential of these characters in like this newly realized Final Fantasy VII trilogy of games because like on the one hand playing like a PlayStation 1 game in 1997 you just have the dialogue like on your screen and maybe some character movements but you're not getting like the full voice acting full motion like experience that you're getting now yeah so especially with like for example Aerith and Tifa's whole friendship like you get bits and pieces of that in the first game like with remake but in rebirth that's even more fully realized and i just really loved the connection that they have with each other and yeah. you get to really really see that now with all of the advances we've made in gaming you know there's so much personality and character here like it's fun that now because yuffie is no longer optional she was yep. optional in the original Final Fantasy VII, but now she has to join the party. She is a major part because that's so much work you have to put in. Why make her optional, right? Yeah. Um, and it's fun to see her bouncing off of characters like Cloud and Barrett, <laughs> to see Barrett and Red Thirteen's camaraderie. Like, they changed the Cosmo Canyon section so that, like, when he has to do the task and go into the Gee Caves and, like, do his trials... It's not just anyone who can join him. Like, Bugenhagen specifically points out, like, you, you are up for the task. He points to Barrett. And he's like, what? Yep. <laughs> Why do I gotta go help this cat? Come on. <laughs> you have, like, your own set party that you can, like, obviously make. Like, I think for the majority of the game, I played as Cloud Tifa Barrett, OG3. <laughs> yeah. Um, but there's certain points in the game where you have to play as other characters. So you get interactions with other characters that you didn't think you would necessarily like get but when they do happen it's amazing and i think that just exemplifies how fully flushed out this whole cast is like the i love i love it when casts work great with each other and not necessarily with just the main character or have it only a direct relationship with the main character yeah like there'll be times where cloud is suffering from his mako poisoning and he's got a headache and he's got to sit down and 
Now Yuffie, Barrett, and Tifa are going to do their own little side adventure, and we get to follow those three and not Cloud. So it's interesting mixing and matching with the party and seeing what kind of fun combinations we can get out of that. Um, and again, it's just the character dynamics is just they're just so fun. I like this game is full in on the whole affection system because they know like, OK, everyone's looking forward to the gold saucer date. We got the gold saucer <laughs> date, definitely. So we're going to have an, an actual proper affection system where you're going to see the little smiley faces above each character's heads. And the happier that smile is, the more close to cloud they are. And so you'll be in town, you'll be in calm, and, and you'll just be walking around and, oh, there's Barrett. I'll talk to Barrett. Oh, I have a choice of what to say to him. Uh, I'll say this. Your relationship with Barrett has deepened, you know, and you'll see his smiley face has changed a little bit. And it's like, oh, I got I'm closer with Barrett. And so by the end, when you get to the gold saucer date, they actually give you a straight up warning. They, they warn you like, yep, you are coming into the date scene. If you are not satisfied with who is closest with you right now, consider doing side quests to build up that affection. <laughs> Because a lot of the side quests are tied to certain characters where, like, if you do this quest, Aerith is there with you accepting the quest. And maybe if you finish it, Aerith will have a deeper appreciation for Cloud for having done that side quest. So there's benefits to doing side quests because it gets you closer to the party members. And it also encourages you to do the synergy abilities, which are these completely new aspect of the gameplay where every time you do an ATB move, it adds to this little bar. You'll get like five bars and then you can get one just for doing braver or focus thrust or whatever. You get another bar for doing dive kick or overcharge or whatever your, your abilities are. You can do a spell as well, like magic materia, fire. Yeah, lightning. magic counts. And when you have like three for two different characters, those two characters can team up and do this crazy synergy move that where they do this. In, it's sort of like a mini limit break, I suppose. Kind of, yeah. Where they'll just team up and do this crazy thing that will raise a stagger meter or keep a stagger meter slow, or they'll boost each other and get extra ATB meter so that they can get more abilities out at once. And it not only is used for combat, but it also deepens the relationship with Cloud and other characters. So when Cloud and Tifa do a synergy move, your relationship with Tifa has changed. It has deepened, you know? And you can also say things that reduce your relationship with other people. That's true. <laughs> so it won't necessarily say that your relationship is deepened, but it'll say your relationship has changed. <laughs> so that's just sad. I, I had a bit of fun with that for certain characters. <laughs> <laughs> Any examples? There were certain things that I said to Yuffie where our relationship just wasn't the best. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the affection system is fun, and I think a lot of people are going to be satisfied with the gold saucer dates. I'll just say that. It's definitely more clear than the original, where yes. it's like, okay, well then I guess I will do this, and maybe I will get what I want when I go to the gold saucer. Yeah, But no, in this game, there are very clear guidelines for how you specifically have to get the person that you want for your gold saucer date. But, but getting back to just the pure excitement of the whole game, like it just felt like it was set piece after set piece after set piece after set piece. And there was never a moment where I was like bored or frustrated or, or no. anything. I, like Remake is a game that has a lot of slow walking scenes and a lot of downtime and some of the dungeons go on a bit long. I don't think that's the case with Rebirth personally no there's always something to do in rebirth whether that's main story side quest mini game and the dungeons they do have they feel like a nice reprieve from all of the open world stuff or all of the crazy wacky stuff that happens in the story that they didn't feel long to me they felt like an evenly paced game the, the only issue i had with pacing at all in this game was just the final three hours or so like the the last dungeon and the final boss i feel go on a bit too long but that's pretty much it for the whole entire game yeah you know you're fighting a crazy sea serpent and then you're riding a fun dolphin through this crazy mini game 
and then you're in a parade and you're doing fun dancing parade stuff and all oh, that whole june in segment was amazing i loved oh. being in enemy territory and seeing just the propaganda on the posters and seeing what rude and his boys were up to i didn't realize <laughs> playing the original Final Fantasy VII, that he was in a club filled with bald men. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there are things about the remake that make you catch notice of the original, like, oh, is that what was going on? Oh, oh okay. I guess I, ne I never noticed that, even though I've beaten the game like 10,000 times. Yeah. Uh, just, they do fun stuff with that. Uh, Elena, they brought Elena into the fold and she has not been in any of these things like she wasn't in crisis core she wasn't in uh, uh she wasn't in friggin dirge of cerberus she wasn't in an advent children okay she was in advent children but she didn't say anything is what i'm is what i'm saying <laughs> yeah elena has been missing from all the compilation and i was waiting for her to come back into the fold and i loved her she was amazing oh elena's <laughs> awesome she's my She's, she was my favorite Turk member in this game. Ah, uh, So sassy. I love her. I love it. <laughs> yeah, she's very, very sassy. I would say more so than the original. But yes. uh, it's all for the better of her character. She's just so fun to listen on screen. And God. It's God. <laughs> the other thing I like compared to Remake is that it's not spending so much time throwing whispers in your face to be like, oh, we're doing something meta and crazy. We're doing something wacky. The whispers are dead. So like most of the time, everything's just playing out without any weird metaphysical supernatural interruptions, which I think makes the yeah. story a lot better for it. It makes it more grounded in a way. Yeah. Like you're not constantly thinking about like, oh, what's happening or what's what's going on with this element. Like there are plot developments that are interesting. I think the way the parade ends in Junon was like, oh, like I was really curious where they were going with that. Yeah. Um, but it never feels intrusive. It never feels like it's nudging you and being like, get it? We're changing things. Get it? <laughs> Haha, -ha, you get it? It was different this time. Yeah. <laughs> like, I just like when they organically introduce new things. Like this element where Sephiroth is trying to convince Cloud that Tifa's not real. Oh, yeah, that part. Oh. That wasn't part of the original. It wasn't an aspect of the original game, but it's like, well, I cut her. You know, I slashed her with my sword. She's dead, Cloud. So who is this girl with you right now? Are you sure you can trust her? Because I don't think she's real. And that adds to a whole bunch of conflict between the two characters. Because, yeah, it's, it's like, what can you trust about Cloud's memories? But well, what can you trust about Tifa's memories? Is Tifa actually Tifa? Or is this all bullshit? Oh, my God. <laughs> yeah i get you there and i think that gets good experimentation for like seeing how the characters interact with each other um so you mentioned like you happy being seeing elena in the game um i was happy to see rufus in the game oh boy and like oh, finally boy. like when what do you mean oh boy i'm just saying you really liked rufus in remake <laughs> i'm just saying you really liked him the first time and we get a lot more of him in the second game Yes, we do, and it's great. Um, <laughs> but I knew when, like, the 7 remake was announced, I was like, oh my gosh, we're going to see the Rufus parade in HD current gen uh. graphics. And I got what I wanted here, and I'm so happy. I've been waiting years to see how they would play it out, and it was so much more than what I was asking for in a good way. And, ugh, good shit. Oh Good my god, show. it was insane. I, again, mm -hmm. I have to compliment the soundtrack for this game, because I, I think the, the OST comes out in seven CDs, and they made so many different versions of every single song in the game. Like, there is a calm version of the Rufus Parade. There is a vocal <laughs> version of the Rufus yeah. Parade. There is a bombastic version of the Rufus Parade when you're just walking around. There's a version where you're actually in the parade and you're performing it to that version of the song. Um, the Gold Saucer does this really cool thing where when you go on a date with someone, it incorporates their theme song into the Gold Saucer theme. So... Yeah. You know, usually it's just but then if you're on a date with Tifa, you'll hear 
her theme chime in every now and then. And if you're on a date with Aerith, you'll hear Aerith's theme chime in during the Gold Saucer theme. Or you'll, if you're on a date with Red 13, you'll hear Red 13's theme chime in in the Gold Saucer. Like there's so many versions, so many renditions, just calm versions of themes, battle versions of themes. And then you'll do weird side quests where these are optional. You don't have to do them. They're completely <laughs> optional. What are you talking about? <laughs> and I'm escorting a dog, and I'm trying to get a dog to another part of Junon. <laughs> and we get that. <laughs> that whole theme song. <laughs> and you only hear it, like, in that part of the game. I know, and it was so, so you good. Could completely, you could completely miss this. <laughs> and it's such a good theme song. Holy shit. Even like the new tracks, like I, I complimented Remake's new tracks, like its original compositions, but I also have to compliment them here because th there are so many great original compositions from the stamp song to Kyrie getting her own fucking theme song voiced yes. by Erica Harlicker. <laughs> Like, why does she get her own bombastic bop theme song that actually sounds awesome? <laughs> <laughs> and then I, one of my favorite set pieces in the whole entire game was climbing up Mount Corel. Um, oh, yeah, that track is amazing. Cloud, Aerith, and Red 13 are scaling this mountain. And already I kind of love the visual of it because the higher you go up that cliffside... You start taking a look back from where you came, and you can see Costa del Sol in the background and the beach in the background, and you're so high up. It really feels like you've climbed a mountain, and it really feels like you've gone such a huge distance. The world feels so fucking gigantic. I love it for that. But the theme song that plays during Mount Corel while you're climbing that mountain, original composition. It was not part of the original Final Fantasy VII, and it's like one of the most triumphant, heart pumping adventurous fucking themes i've ever heard i loved it i i put it into my mp3 player and i started walking around to it and it makes walking around so much better <laughs> like at you you og final fantasy 7 fan walking around with an mp3 player i know i know like the mount Corel theme was <laughs> exquisite i loved that piece of music it was just oh chef's kiss mm -hmm. i I just think the soundtrack goes above and beyond, you know, even just like a lot of the world map themes. And it's not just silence when you're in the world map, which I appreciate. No. Like some games like Fallout or Elder Scrolls will just be like dead silent or, or, or even Zelda Breath of the Wild or something will just be dead silent. And you'll just be listening to just the ambiance and the wind blowing and, you know, that's fine. But rebirth decides to have actual theme songs for its open worlds and it, they're great theme songs like when you're going through cosmo canyon you get this western westernized version of the overworld theme from the from the original so it's like yeah mm -hmm. it, it feels like just a a fun canyony kind of version of the overworld or when you're in gongaga they have this fantastic tropical choir thing going on where like there's chanting and it's just it's so magical and i sang along to the music so much in this game <laughs> yeah at the beginning of the game when you first go to the chocobo farm i mean i must have sang along to that song for hours i was just singing along like i just the music was perfection. It was exactly what I wanted. It's the gold saucer themes are amazing. Rufus's parade is amazing. They even start incorporating songs that I also love from the original that hadn't come up yet. The mithril mine, the mithril oh, mine yeah. sounded That's so fucking beautiful. Mm -hmm. Oh my God. The, they made that cave theme so fucking magical. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gushing because I genuinely loved this thing. I was shocked how much I loved it. Well, it's just nice to have a soundtrack where, like... Because I play games that have really great soundtracks, but, like, obviously it follows one genre or one type of instrumentation, or maybe it's all orchestral, or maybe it's all, like, one particular, like, theme. 
but um and there's nothing wrong with that but i think rebirth excels very well in having like a variety of musical genres that their songs will just pick from because you have like good nature themes but you also have good wacky themes but you also have great rock themes you know like it's wild how much variety there is in the soundtrack and i think that's like its biggest strength because it doesn't feel like i'm getting bored by the soundtrack or it doesn't feel like i'm per expecting or predicting some sort of like musical form it takes on later yeah. like you know what i'm saying there's like a lot of variety yeah i get you and even with the banger soundtrack and the great combat this thing is packed to the brim with mini games like, oh yes, <laughs> there's so many mini games. There here. are so many oh, fucking game. mini games, and almost all of them are fun. Like almost yeah. all of them. Like Chocobo Racing's in here. It's fucking great. It's oh, way better than Chocobo the original. Chocobo Racing is awesome. Uh huh. There's like drifting and power ups, and it it genuinely feels like it could have been its own game. And I I know Square's made tons of Chocobo Racing games. They had one on the Switch not too long ago. I think this is more fun than that. <laughs> <laughs> why, yeah, like, why can't this be, like, the Chocobo racing game that we get? I'll just play, like, Rebirths over and over again. <laughs> I was shocked. Um, you know, they had this fun frog minigame where you, yeah. you, you turn into a frog and you have to basically, they turned Fall Guys, but you're a frog. <laughs> just gotta stay on the platform for as long as you can. Yeah. Um, we got the Queen's Blood card game. Oh my god. How... <laughs> Yeah, the I that was a huge time sink as well. Like I was not yeah. expecting to like that as much as I did, and I'm just say it, it's the best card system Final Fantasy's ever had. It's better than Triple Triad. I like it more eh, than Triple Triad. I'm going eh, to say it. Eh, I don't I don't know about that. <laughs> I don't know about that. It was kind of rough for me to get it at first because I was like trying to figure out what the dots and the numbers were trying to represent but once that was like settled away it was fine and then i was like winning matches yeah um it's fun it's fine it's not entirely like mandatory for you to do like there are instances in the game where you would have to use it but like you can entirely avoid queen's blood um if you want to oh, yeah. <laughs> um but it was it was fine it was fun i'm not sure if i can say that it's better than triple triad but i liked it <laughs> I think it's addictive. I like how much they put into it. Like, even, like, going through all of the Queen's Blood matches, it also has its own dedicated storyline with its own twist ending. Yeah. That uh, was crazy. Like, it just feels like they put so much effort into every single side quest. I mean, other than, like, the open mm -hmm. world micromanagement stuff, like, Chadley wants you to check out these live stream fonts. He wants you to find these summon shrines so you can synchronize with the summon spirits and you have to like activate clock towers or you have to activate these radio towers and other like a lot of that stuff is not the most exciting thing in the world but when it comes to just like the the overall side quests and the proto relic quests which the proto relic quests have a lot of cool lore and a great payoff if you're a final fantasy fan and I, i'm saying a Final Fantasy VII fan. No, I'm saying a Final Fantasy fan. If you like the whole series, you're going to want to do the Proto Relic stuff because that's really fun. <laughs> um, It's just a big love letter that just taps into all of these different things. Like, there are things about the, the mini games that use the Gambit system from Final Fantasy XII. There are things about how Aerith will 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 compose herself that makes me think of yuna from final fantasy 10 yeah. mm -hmm. there are things that are like feel like are callbacks to 13 and callbacks to this game and callbacks to that game and it's not just a love letter to final fantasy 7 this is a love letter to final fantasy in general this is like yes the absolute epitome and example of why final fantasy is such a great franchise and it just makes me appreciate the series in a much bigger way than even Final Fantasy 16 does. Like, I just loved this game from every part of it. I was just having a, a big ass smile the whole time. My cheeks hurt from smiling so much when I was playing this game. <laughs> and I don't have a lot of issues with it because, again, I think the combat is so satisfying, like it was in Remake. And 
It's just pure fan service the whole way through. It's always giving you exactly what you want, um, except for the Moogles. <laughs> I was going to say, you know, it would have been a love letter to Final Fantasy if they fixed the Moogles in this game, because, oh my gosh, they are atrocious. <laughs> Oh, like, yeah. what was wrong with how they looked in 16? <laughs> they looked fine in 16! <laughs> Why did you just do that? <laughs> oh, boy. Yeah, the Moogles are very strange looking. Uh, they're like koalas. No, they're ugly! <laughs> they're ugly as fuck! They're... I don't like them! <laughs> <laughs> okay, they're ugly as fuck, but they... They're yes, like, thank you. They're like weird koala versions of Moogles. They kind of look like koala bears, but like... If they have teeth whenever they talk and big weird eyes. <laughs> but at least the Moogle theme plays when you visit their huts, okay? It's like some rejected lost Disney 80s media. <laughs> it's like, for specifically, like, it's like there's like some lost episode of the adventures of the gummy bears out there. And it just like stars these Moogles. <laughs> I don't know. It just reminds me of that aesthetic. I'm like, I can't, I can't, I can't. No, abort. No. Yeah. Hi. <sighs> it's it's. I don't have a lot I can criticize. I, again, I. No. No. I just think the ending is a little badly paced because I think the final dungeon goes on a bit too long. It just drags. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I also think the final boss drags. I think it's it. There are things. How many forms does a boss need? You know. How many forms do as a boss need is all I'm going to say. And um, and I guess without getting into spoiler territory, there is an element of the ending that I think makes it not as impactful as it could be, but it still leaves me with lots of questions about where the third game is going, and it's interesting, and I'm already down for the ride because I've accepted since Remake's ending that things are going to be different. I knew things were going to be different. Mm -hmm. I I I can I can't change that. It's it's done. Things are going to be different. I can't change that. So now I'm just along for the ride and I want to see if it's well done or whatever. Um yeah, obviously we can't talk too much about like what the ending entails and like those details, but personally I can say is that sign me up for the third game. I am in on this. I had a great time. Let's go. <laughs> yeah. Like, no matter what. Sometimes it's... you gotta turn your brain off. Sometimes you gotta turn your brain off with video games, man. <laughs> you just gotta turn it off. Turn your brain off. <laughs> like, in terms of pure fan service, though, it's just like, again, the Whisper Ghosts were not constantly in my face the whole time, and I liked the developments of the plot. I liked how things were changing because it didn't feel like it, get in, it got in the way of the overall Final Fantasy VII story. Um, everything that you remember about Disc 1 pretty much happens. Like, when we go to Gold Saucer, yeah, the whole Barrett storyline is there, and we get to experience it. And it's very emotional, and it's very impactful. Yeah. It's like everything you expect from Disc 1 is there, and it's mm -hmm. well done, and it's everything I could want. Now, obviously, there's, like, developments in the story, new changes and new aspects that are happening that were not part of the original. Um, certain revelations are not really revelations. They're just kind of given out to you immediately. And it's like, oh, okay. <laughs> I guess we're rolling with this. <laughs> they're actually talking about this instead of waiting for a surprise twist. Wow, they're actually acknowledging it now. Whoa, that's different. Um... But overall, it you know, it, it doesn't feel like half-assed or anything. Like No. This is a masterpiece. I love this game. Yes. It's amazing. I'm I'm I can't wait to play it on hard mode. I can't wait to uh just go through it again and just master all the Coliseum challenges and stuff. And I just I had so much fun. And uh yeah. <laughs> I'm beaming because I don't have lots to criticize. I really loved it. It's a 10 out of 10 from the two of us. <laughs> yeah. And obviously we have different experiences with, I guess, the mythos. Mythos. <laughs> mythos. Mythos. So me <laughs> with De dear, dear mythos. <laughs> with the mythos and the lore and the world of Final Fantasy VII. 
whereas Clement played Seven in his childhood. I only played Seven for the first time like 10 years ago when I was like high school aged. Yeah. So obviously we're going to have different experiences to draw on from going into Rebirth, but definitely from the two of us, we both love this game, I can say. And yeah, I can't wait for part three in 2029. Because <laughs> we're not getting part three for years. We're going to get it on PlayStation <laughs> 6. <laughs> we're, this is not coming out on PS5. I oh, can God. say that right now. Oh, God. P PlayStation 6 is where it's coming out. But uh, either way, it's good shit. <laughs> It's question time! It's question time! Hello, ladies and gentlemen, it's that time again. Because I have a Patreon and people decide to pay me money for it. That's crazy! They can now ask <laughs> questions on this podcast and you can get answered anything you want. So, uh, let's do it. Carrie Rene Rose asks, Aloha, Clement and Caro. First question as always. I hope that both of you are doing well. Yes, we are. For my actual yes. question, if you could think of a game that, in your opinion, could get a remake or a remaster, what would those choices be? As always, going to stay a fan of C-Squared. Love you guys and sending good vibes to you both. Thank you so much. There are a lot of good games out there that I think would get, like, a remake or a remaster. But honestly, I'm just going to name a few that are just at the top of my head. I've given this answer for years, but it's always going to be Legend of Dragoon. Like, yeah. you've got to. It's amazing. But other games that I would like to see remastered or remade in the future, um, I'd like to, and this is kind of a funny answer, but I'd like to see SmackDown vs. Raw 2007 <laughs> get some sort of remaster or some sort of remake because I still think that's the best wrestling game of all time. Um, there's a lot of great general manager and wrestling mechanics in that, and I feel like a remaster that would be amazing. Yeah. And honestly, Sonic the Fighters? I'd like to see that modernized. <laughs> get more Sonic characters in there. Oh, yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Just get, make it so feel those like would be Tekken. my answers. Yes, 100%. <laughs> when it comes to remakes, I have always been the opinion that, like, if you're going to do a remake of something, do a, something of a bad game. Because that way you can hmm, make the bad okay, game yeah. even better and just kind of replace the old bad one. Like... If they would, if they were gonna remake Mega Man X Six, use the same characters, the same Mavericks, <laughs> the same everything, but you know, with better level design and shit. Hell yeah, remake Mega Man X Six. Do it. <laughs> um, in terms of remasters, it's, it's kind of specific and stupid. I know, I know, but it's like they have the Final Fantasy Pixel remasters, and those are good, but they're not one to one exactly the way the old ones were. And, like, I want them to remaster FF1 with the old NES sprites. I want the old NES chiptune music and the old NES graphical style. That remastered. I don't want these pixel updates. I don't <laughs> want the new additions. I don't want the, the new colors. I, I, I want the authentic original thing to be remastered and to be as it actually was. As uh, selfish and stupid as that may seem. Um... Yeah, in general, I think just games that aren't available anymore, like I want remasters yeah. of the Bouncer. Like, let's get the <laughs> Bouncer remaster that gets rid of the blur effect. Come on. Yeah. And as for remakes, eh, I don't need remakes. I'm fine with tons of remasters. I'm fine with tons of games from the past coming back. But when it comes to remakes, I'm not really desperate for anything. You know? Yeah, that's fair. Yeah. Like, if, yeah, I'm fine with it. Thank you for the question. Thank you. Styler asks, what would your top 10 favorite Mega Man games be? I know right off the bat that my first is going to be Mega Man X, because it's the best Mega Man game. No contest. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, followed by Mega Man 1, because I'm a weirdo. <laughs> <laughs> I love that game. Uh, Mega Man 9 in third place. Followed by Mega Man 7 in 4th. Followed by The Misadventures of Tron Bon in 5th. I love Tron mm -hmm. Bon. Yes. And then X4 in 6th. Um, in 7th, it would be X8. In 8th, it would be Mega Man yes. Legends. In 9th, it would be... Um, Mega Man 6. 
I'd say Mega Man 6. Oh, okay. Get some Mega Man 6 love in there. And Mega Man 10th, in 10th place, it'd be Mega Man 10. I'll say that. Oh my gosh. <laughs> That's my pick. <laughs> we got some common ones in this list. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um. Okay. So my favorite Mega Man game is Mega Man 9. I love, love, love that game so much. Uh, my second favorite after 9 would be Mega Man X. Um, that's also one of the first Mega Man games I played. Love that game so much. Um, my third favorite is Mega Man 7. Then Mega Man 1 is fourth. Um, because I do, I do like Mega Man 1 more than a lot of people. Um, I just think it's neat. It's a neat game. <laughs> um, I have- I just okay. think it's neat. <laughs> yeah, it's neat. <laughs> and then in fifth place, um, I have never played this game because it is very inaccessible. But I have seen footage of this game online, I have seen Clement's Let's Play on it, and I know that if I played this game myself, I would love it too. So I put Tron Bon as fifth. Um, six would be X4, seven is Mega Man 2, eight is Mega Man X2, nine is Mega Man ZX, and ten is Mega Man 10. That is my list. Thank you for the yeah. question. Thank you. Gelly Elfson asks, have you been reading any books lately? Any that you would recommend? Unfortunately, no. Um, I have um, a Bob Odenkirk's biography on my backlog. It's uh, comedy, 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 drama. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Basically, the biography about how he was a comedian and for so much of his career into the 80s, into the 90s, into the 2000s, and then Breaking Bad happened. And now his whole career has changed completely. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, unfortunately, I've just been so preoccupied playing all these RPGs like Yakuza and Final Fantasy VII. I just haven't had any time. Yeah. Well, with me, when we, Clement, went to Toronto, we went inside this bookstore and, um, I studied linguistics when I was in college. And linguistics, if you don't know, is a study of different languages and how the history of languages came to be. So yeah. I picked up a book called Holy Shit. And that's the title of the book. It's called Holy <laughs> Shit. And it is an entire history of cuss words and expletive language around the world. <laughs> nice. And I and I love academic stuff like that. Um, but I read Britney Spears' autobiography a few months ago, and I thought that was great. Becky Lynch's new autobiography comes out next month. Not next month. Next week, actually. And I need to pre-order that. So I will be reading that book pretty soon. And... Yeah, with me, it's either reading academic stuff or wrestling autobiographies or maybe the occasional fiction that my coworker suggests. So yeah, thank nice. you for your question. Indubitably. Connor Merritt asks, Hi, Clement and Kara. Hope you're having a great day. My question is, if you've played Like a Dragon Infinite Wealth, what were your favorite boss fights? Thanks again and have a great day. One of my favorite boss fights, and um, this was publicly announced um, in trailers, and the person in question has talked about it um, on social media, but Danny Trejo is in this game. He yeah. is a character in Infinite Wealth, and his boss fight was just... There was nothing really, like, unique in the gameplay sense, but it's the idea of, like, oh my gosh, I'm fighting Danny Trejo in a Yakuza game. Like, <laughs> that was just really funny to me. <laughs> yeah. Uh, my answer, I can't spoil for Caro. All I will say is that it's the final chapter and you're on a boat. That's all I'm going to say, but that fight was fucking crazy. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, right. Runner up would be the end of chapter 12, where we get some very familiar faces. A three on five Ooh, situation. Yeah, that's. That's one of my favorites too. Yeah, three on five situation. But I can't really spoil it. Yeah, mm -hmm. but yeah, it, it it was just hype. You know, it's just those kinds of fights yeah. always make me smile. So, thank you for the question. <laughs> thank you. Robert Boy Genius asks, "What's your thoughts on the compilation slash complication of Final Fantasy VII?" <laughs> oh boy, uh, I kind of went over it mostly in remake, but Advent Children, I. Just, I couldn't jive with it. I'm sorry. Even when I saw it in 2003, I didn't get it. I just didn't feel like Final Fantasy VII to me. It's got lots of fancy combat scenes, but I just don't care about it all that much. Um, 
Dirge of Cerberus, I actively hate. I think the game sucks. I think the game's <laughs> not fun to play. I can't believe people are entertained by the cutscenes when they are so dry and boring. What? They're so what? dry and boring. What? How could you find that entertaining? They're so boring. I it's, don't get it. Well, one man's trash is another person's trash. So <laughs> it will be my trash. Um, Crisis Core is the best of them, for sure. I still don't like Genesis as a villain. I don't like Angeal and stuff. But Zack, he didn't really have much personality in the original Final Fantasy VII. You guys got to remember, he barely talked in the original game. And they gave him so much personality in Crisis Core. And the, I love the original dub. I love the PSP dub. Um, because Gomez, the actor who played um, Zack in the original, fucking perfect line delivery. Perfect voice. He was awesome as Zack in Crisis Core. And uh, he just made every scene work with his reactions to all the silly bullshit that was happening around him. <laughs> yeah. All of my experiences with the wider lore of Seven have been through YouTube reviews. I did see the cutscenes <laughs> for Church of Severus out of suggestion. Um, but I have not played um, Crisis Core. I really want to play like the um, remake of it. Yeah. Because um, so, that is on my list. I am very interested in Zack as a character. Um... I have been begging this boy to watch Advent Children with me for a while now. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> so, we'll get around to it at some point. Um, have you not seen it before? And yeah, I... No. Oh, interesting. So, I know what happens in Advent Children. I just need to see the whole spadangle. Spadangle? The whole spiel. I don't know what I said there. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> the whole... I need to see it all come together. But uh, also, I don't know if you mean if you when you said complication of Final Fantasy VII, you were also referring to like the metaverse, the meta narrative <laughs> weirdness of, of remake, and what the changes about Final Fantasy VII. Um, again, I made a video about it, but it was jarring because I just thought like people want this story that they love so much to be told because the original game was so blocky and ancient, and it doesn't look that good by today's standards. And so it felt kind of strange that they were just like, no, we're going to do whatever the fuck we want now and deal with it. But, um, you know, actually seeing how Rebirth has turned out, I don't think it was nearly as bad as we thought it was going to be. I feel like it is pretty, pretty faithful to the original Final Fantasy VII, even still with all these changes. And, um... Yeah, I'm fine with it. Like, until... Unless part three just goes balls crazy and just does the... <laughs> and they just do something insane. Like, I don't know what they would do in three, but... um, I'm fine with it. Like, I accepted the fact that Remake is not going to be a one-to-one -one ex exact duplicate of the original Final Fantasy VII. So, whatever. I'll deal with it. I've been loving what they've been doing without getting into spoilers. <laughs> <laughs> so... I will scratch my head if they drop the ball in three, but I won't be as mad as other people for understandable reasons. Yeah. I'm just here for the ride, okay? <laughs> 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 I'm just here for it. Just, throw, just, just give me whatever. Cool. Thank you for the question. Thank you. The Red Lucario asks, Hi Clement, I just wanted to know how you became a Mega Man fan as you helped me become a big Mega Man fan. Um, well, mostly just exposure, just because I was a big gamer, you know, um, my first time I ever played it was at a friend's house. He had a Game Boy. It was the first time I ever saw the Game Boy and he had a copy of Mega Man 2 for the Game Boy. And I just remember thinking that was really fun at the time. I thought the music was great. Um, <laughs> it's one of the more infamous Mega Man games for its soundtrack, but I enjoyed the bops and the boops and I thought it was very challenging <laughs> and, um, that got me into the anniversary collection for GameCube, where I played through one through eight through that. Um, and I, I didn't play the ideal versions of those games, but I eventually played the rest on emulators and stuff. And Mega Man 9 was definitely the one that solidified it for sure. That was just like, oh, fuck, I love Mega Man. <laughs> Mega Man 9 was so damn good. And I was just like, well, you know, what? I want to play all through all the Mega Man games on YouTube. And that's how that came to be. 
my childhood friend, um, this was when I was in high school, so this was around 10 years ago. So my childhood friend, um, who still is my best friend today, um, invited me over to his house one day. And, like, we were going through his virtual console on the Wii U, and he had Mega Man 1. And so I played, we played through Mega Man 1. Um, we died a lot, but <laughs> eventually we finished it. Um, we were just kind of passing the controller to each other, and I didn't know shit about Mega Man, so I was dying, like, all the time. <laughs> so really, he was the one that was carrying me through the whole game. And I was like, yeah, that was really fun, that was really hard, but that was really fun. And it was funny, because I had just gotten into Clement's channel a few months before this, but with Sonic. Yeah. So when I got home that night, I was like, okay, um, Mega Man's great. I'm going to see if there are any Mega Man reviews or videos or Let's Plays on YouTube that I can, like, watch to get to know more about Mega Man. This guy's videos popped up <laughs> when I put it into the search bar on YouTube. <laughs> So I'm like, okay, I guess you do Mega Man as well. Okay. Um, it's very coincidental. And the rest is pretty much history. Yeah. And I showed you how good these games could be. <laughs> Thank you for the question. Thank you for the question. And finally, Ruben Dorado asks, Clement and Caro, what is your favorite music visualizer? There are many greats when talking about Windows XP Media Player and many others. My favorite ones are the PSP visualizers and PS3 Earth One. What are yours, if any? That's an interesting question. I love this question. I probably would say the same about the PSP visualizer, actually, because like mm -hmm. when you put an MP3 in there, there are so many different like wavelength kind of animations they can do, little explosions and stuff that they can have to like visualize how all the music is being communicated. And I've always loved that. I've always loved that. Um, yeah. But I am the fossil who still listens to my PSP in the year 2024. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I'm going to steal that answer. I like the PSP visualizer. I'm a sucker for Windows XP. Um, so I'm definitely going to say the Windows XP media player there. I think, what was another one from that generation? Real time? Winamp. Music? Winamp. Yeah. That's another one of my favorites. Yeah. Um, and then I'm with you on the PSP because I always, I always like looking at the screen whenever I was listening to music on my PSP as a kid. I don't know. There's something mesmerizing about that. So it's the good I think shit. Those would be my answers. Yeah. Those would be my answers. And Sony had personality. Uh, <laughs> Damn. <laughs> but anywho, thank you everybody for those questions, and it's been quite the long, long discussion. Yes. I think we gushed a lot. We did. I can't I can't help it. It was good shit. It was such good shit. <laughs> Final Fantasy VII Rebirth it was, was such amazing. Good shit. <laughs> it definitely was. And now that this podcast is in the bag, uh, next week I'm going to be flying out to meet up with Caro, and then we're going to be spending the WrestleMania weekend together in Philadelphia. Yep, because WrestleMania is coming over here, which is exciting because I don't have to do the traveling. <laughs> it's coming to me this year. <laughs> yeah. And uh, we get to see Cody Rhodes finally finish the story. Finally finish against Roman Reigns. I promise you that this is the year. I think if Roman wins, I think Philly is going to, like, cease to exist. Well, good thing I'm flying out immediately. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, and otherwise, yeah, that means I'm going to be gone for a few weeks, which means I won't be able to work on Mortal Kombat, so it's definitely not going to be out until April, and I apologize for that. Uh, it's been a very busy few months. This project, this Mortal Kombat project is huge. It's taken me so long just to finish it. And uh, it will be finished in April. I vow, I guarantee, it will be finished in April. And um, yeah, and then I'm going to have some changes for the Patreon. And I'm going to have some changes for how I operate going forward. Because I've had, I've had a lot of soul searching. And I don't know if my current system is working as well as I'd like it to. Um, but if you haven't been signed up for the Patreon lately, uh, you should check out my new side quest series where while I'm making videos, I'm also seeing movies and I'm playing new games. And if you wanted to hear my opinions on Oxen Free 2 or Mean Girls 2024 or Argyle, the 
new movie from the Kingsman guy, then uh, <laughs> you can check out Side Quests. It's available to all tiers of my patrons. Everybody gets to experience it if you pay any a tier. And uh, you'll get to hear my thoughts on all the movies and games I'm watching slash playing while I make these videos. So yeah. Amazing. Amazing, amazing, amazing. But yeah, I am the great Clement. And I am Caro. Thank you so much for listening again. And please, please stay safe out there. Hydrate. Don't go into vans with people who say Pikachu! <laughs> no! <laughs> no. <laughs> and we'll see you next time. We'll see you next time, y'all.